This video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. What's up guys? Michael here to talk about the only place where it's acceptable to wear gym shorts and eat pizza for two weeks straight while being guided through the works of Dostoevsky by a PhD in Russian literature. Yeah, college. A key aspect of the American dream. Receiving a college education has long been seen as critical to living a good and prosperous life. But increasingly, higher education comes with crippling debt and fewer job opportunities. Young adults today are better educated than ever and increasingly downwardly mobile. But it wasn't always destined to be this way. So how did the great American college experiment blow up in our faces? Let's find out in this wisecrack deep dive into higher education. What went wrong? Okay, before we keep going, I wanna tell you about this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN keeps your data secure everywhere you go on the internet, thanks to their secure protocols and uncrackable encryption. Now, something that I really like about using Surfshark is that it keeps my location completely private, which is a huge advantage when I'm buying stuff like plane tickets, because if a website knows where I am, they can gouge prices based on what they think I can afford, and we don't want them to do that, do we? All I have to do is connect my secure Surfshark VPN to other VPNs around the world until I track down the best price. And speaking of the world, these connections also make it easy to watch all the content that hasn't been released in your country. I'm a sucker for a lot of UK shows, so with Surfshark, it's very easy for me to access things that otherwise I wouldn't be able to watch. Now, all of your favorite devices are included with a single subscription, so your laptop, Android, Amazon Fire Stick, PlayStation, and more. Plus, you can still use your favorite apps like Chrome and Firefox. So get started by clicking the link in the description and using the promo code WISECRACK. When you do, you'll get Surfshark VPN for 83% off plus three extra months for free. So go to surfshark.deals slash wisecrack or hit the link in the description. Protect yourself online and download Surfshark VPN today. And now, back to the show. So the modern university is a lot like pizza and that it started a long time ago in Italy and then got taken to America, where initially only World War II veterans wanted it, but eventually it became a rite of passage for every American teenager. Okay, let me explain. The first modern university started in 1088 in Bologna. What made it modern is that it was independent of the church and granted degrees. They had six areas of study broken up into pairs of three. Grammar, rhetoric, and logic, basically the humanities wing, and geometry, music, and astronomy, their version of STEM. Soon after this, in the 12th century, the University of Paris and Oxford were established, and it was off to the races. An important part of early European universities was the recovery of Aristotle, a time during which most of Aristotle's texts were translated into Latin, the standard academic language of the time. This led to the emergence of scholasticism, a school of thought which used Aristotelian categories as a jumping off point for the study of the humanities and the sciences, and which was synthesized with Christian theology by people like Thomas Aquinas. And as European universities expanded, they considered intellectual inquiry a part of fully embracing one's humanity and even developing one's spiritual self. It also engendered a style of study marked by close readings of text led by scholars or teachers, reflections on those texts, and then discussions about those texts. Basically, an early version of the lecture and seminar style of teaching that still dominates today. But importantly, these universities were not places where people primarily trained for careers, but places where one carried out humanistic courses of study in philosophy, theology, language, and natural science. And the first American universities like Harvard, Yale, and Princeton basically picked this up and riffed on it. The same universities that would go on to count numerous prestigious war criminals as alumni. Hello, Dick Cheney and George W. Bush. For much of America's history, both pre and post revolution, the university was a bastion of learning, but typically only for preparing people to be teachers or members of the clergy. And while these universities weren't one for one copies of Oxford, they were still largely working in a European model that emphasized education in the humanities and natural sciences. Basically, they were a few years off from offering coding boot camps. Because these jobs were not particularly well paid, people pursuing them were seen as doing so for the benefit of their community. So their communities typically paid for their education, whether through government funding or donations. Robert L. Geiger, education historian, explains that as a result, many early colleges, including Stanford and Baruch University, charge students nothing 
Despite that, they were still mostly attended by the wealthy, in part because as 18th century farm boy, it was hard to convince your dad to let you go off to study Aristotle and Mozart for four years. Over the mid 19th century, colleges proliferated all over the country, usually founded by philanthropic, religious, or special interest groups. Federal incentives to create colleges started in 1862 with the Morrill Land Grant Act, in which states were rewarded for selling Western land if it was used to host college programs in agriculture, mechanical, and military sciences. Federal funding continued to pour into higher education for decades. At the same time, changes caused by the Industrial Revolution created a need for highly trained managers and other professionals. This shifted college from something that facilitated intellectual exploration and training for service-oriented vocations into a place that would help you achieve professional success. And this is about where things still stood in the waning years of World War II. College was basically the exclusive luxury of the wealthy and elite, and in 1940, just 15% of people aged 18 to 21 were enrolled. But that was all about to change and mostly to avoid pissing off veterans, as chronicled by journalist Will Bunch in his book, After the Ivory Tower Falls. See, after World War I, veterans, frustrated at the minimal benefits offered to them, had lobbied for more government support. In the aftermath of the Great Depression, they took their grievances to the street in a protest march on Washington that turned bloody after police responded. Shocking, we know. Not eager to run this one back, and approaching his fourth presidential election, Franklin Roosevelt wanted to revive the excitement of the New Deal. Thing is, most of his ideas relied on higher taxes on the wealthy, which weren't about to make it through Congress. But helping veterans? That was different, because it could attract the support of conservative allies eager to support the troops, even if it took the form of housing, educational, or unemployment benefits, rather than direct cash via the GI Bill. As Bunch writes, college benefits were an afterthought and emerged from the Capitol Hill negotiations only as somewhat of an accident. Basically, nobody seriously thought that returning soldiers, many of whom came from working class families and hadn't even finished high school, would be that interested in higher education, which remained heavily gatekept by the wealthy elite. For their part, those like the University of Chicago's president feared the GI Bill would transform colleges into, quote, hobo jungles full of ignorant, lazy vagabonds. If only he was around now to watch Rush Week at Arizona State or UCF. Anyway, promises to pay for veterans' education, along with a stipend for their books and living expenses, didn't seem like a big commitment. At most, like, one million would take advantage of the opportunity, right? Wrong. By late 1946, veterans made up nearly half of American undergraduates, and to everyone's surprise, performed as well as or better in class despite not having any Rockefeller blood in their veins. Blood that was probably inbred anyways. According to Bunch, college education started being treated as a new national priority and a public good, and not just for World War II vets. After Roosevelt died, President Truman established a Commission on Higher Education, which concluded that the federal government should ensure free education for all Americans through the first two years of college, and even longer for lower income students. There were two sides to this proposal, an idealistic one and a military one. Idealistically, commissioners believed that a generalized liberal education would nurture democracy and foster a more equal America. At the same time, universities were seen as a place where the Cold War would be won, in science and technology classrooms and through Pentagon-funded research, as dispersed by the National Science Foundation, which was established in 1950. Just a quick note, this was the beginning of a marriage between the military and the university that is oh so alive and well to this day. So if you feel like marriage doesn't work, just look at the military industrial complex and the government and have hope that you can find that too. Despite the Truman Commission's urging, no federal legislation followed. According to Bunch, that's in large part because Southern congressmen feared federal involvement with campuses would force them to desegregate. So yeah, you can blame some of the reason for your student loan debt on Southerners' refusal to give up segregation. Oh, also they were scared of all the commie professors who had fled Europe to teach in America. Um, they fled Europe because of the Holocaust. You know, like cultural scholar and theorist Theodore Adorno and Albert F Einstein, you know, the guy who invented gravity. But even without legislation, college enrollment was skyrocketing, as was tuition. From 1956 to 1970, enrollment tripled, while spending on college education spiked sixfold. But in 1957, things changed dramatically when Russia won the first lap of the space race via the satellite Sputnik. By 1958, a spooked Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, which both increased research funding and offered something new, 
student loans. This was a compromise. Widespread student scholarships struck conservatives as a bit socialist. At a time when being even a little Marx curious could get you excommunicated from society. So student loans put more of the onus on students' future selves to fund their own education because education was an investment, not a right. The idea of student loans came out of free market economist Milton Friedman's human capital theory, which saw the human being as a unit of investment. Investing in college students was seen as a smart thing to do. The payoff was a well-educated adult with a high chance of landing a good job. I wonder how much I'm worth as a unit of investment. I don't think much. Notably, the establishment of loans expressed a growing strain of thought that education was not going to be, as FDR and the Truman Commission argued, a matter of public good, but of personal responsibility. According to Bunch, the late 50s and early 60s were the golden age of American college, a time when higher education seemed to deliver on its offer of upward mobility, fostering democracy and civil engagement and furthering advancements in science and technology. Of course, the golden age was anything but perfect. Colleges in the South fought to maintain segregation, and when black students were admitted, they faced violent racism. Like the University of Texas's first black law school student admitted after he won a case in the Supreme Court. During his first semester, someone burnt a cross on campus. With the passing of President Lyndon Johnson's Higher Education Act in 1965, federally guaranteed student loans were expanded for the middle class as were scholarships for lower income students. Expanding student loans was an earnest attempt to make college more widely accessible while still palatable to conservatives. College was officially mainstream, a new rite of passage, and a new youth culture flourished thanks to increased leisure time and the free thinking inspired by the widespread liberal arts curriculum. By the time baby boomers had taken over campuses, this became the counterculture, and activists spearheaded radical movements about free speech, civil rights, and women's rights via groups like the Students for a Democratic Society. This caused tension from the get-go. Take the University of California, Berkeley, where overt student political activity had been banned as a vestige of McCarthyism. It became the site of the free speech protest, culminating in rallies that were met with police brutality. Spurred on by anti-Vietnam War sentiment, student activism intensified. Ironically, as college students raged against the war, the expanding university ecosystem was being bankrolled by federal funding for military-focused STEM research. College activism was met with a conservative backlash embodied by California Governor Ronald Reagan, who tried and basically failed to end the state's long-standing tradition of free tuition. Though he did manage to establish a different fiscal burden for students via sky-high enrollment fees. He lobbied for public hearings on the communism and sexual promiscuity he believed was infiltrating UC campuses, which, I mean, if only. Importantly, Reagan argued that the liberal arts education of the time was misguided and that college should be about training workforces, not, say, expanding students' minds. This is so basically a complete disconnect from the classical vision of humanistic education. The violence of the 1960s political movements culminated with the Kent State Massacre, in which National Guardsmen opened fire on students protesting the Vietnam War, killing four. Known as the Day the 60s Died, these killings ignited national protest, an outcry from an older middle America who believed college students were delinquent. In a Gallup poll from the time, a whopping 58% of Americans blamed the Kent State students for their own deaths, while just 11% blamed the National Guard who actually fired the bullets out of their guns that they pointed at students while their fingers were on the triggers of the guns with the bullets that were pointed at the students. But, but what, do, what do I know? I've never been in the National Guard. Over the course of the early 1970s, the conservative backlash to the counterculture born on college campuses, which led to the election of Richard Nixon, would, according to Bunch, change the American way of college and crush the egalitarian dreams of the post-war planners. Basically, once college became mainstream, it created a lot of free thinkers who looked at American society and didn't like what they saw. And this pissed off a lot of powerful people. This backlash came down to the fact that college campuses had become a place where ideologies that threatened the capitalist machine could flourish. But money was about to get in the way of all of that. In 1970, the average American student paid $585 tuition per year. Again, they paid for a whole year of college, $585. That's crazy. Either I literally think there's textbooks that cost almost that much now. 
in the comments, let us know what your most expensive textbook ever was. That was about to start changing and fast, but the reason was counterintuitive. Let's flash back a second to Johnson's creation of a federally guaranteed student loan plan in 1965. Importantly, Johnson had a big problem. His Great Society movement, which included Medicare, Medicaid, and aid for elementary and secondary education, had drastically increased government spending and thus the federal deficit. A big deficit hurts the government's ability to borrow money at low interest rates. And because of arcane budget rules, his student loan proposal posed a big problem. As Wall Street Journal reporter Josh Mitchell explains, if the government originated $1 billion in student loans, spending increased by $1 billion. This was a mirage, since the spike would be temporary. Years later, students' monthly payments would reduce the resulting deficit. But what mattered at the time was the immediate budgetary hit. However, if someone else lent money to the students, it was basically off the books as far as the treasury was concerned. So how do you make a ton of money available for students to borrow? you turn to the banks. There was precedent for this. After the Great Depression, Congress had created the Federal Housing Administration to ensure or guarantee some mortgages made by lenders. That eliminated risk for banks lending to potential home buyers. The federal government stepped in to guarantee all student loans and thus limit risks for investors. They set interest rates at 6%. It only took a few months for Johnson's plan to encounter some trouble, namely inflation. Basically, this made issuing loans and thus earning interest less profitable. By 1969, Congress had to raise interest rates to 10% to keep banks willing to participate. At the same time, colleges feared what would happen as the baby boomers started aging out of higher ed, leaving schools with a smaller pool of customers. Because they're customers at the school. It's a service and you're just a customer. As Mitchell writes, banks needed more money. Colleges needed more money. Students needed more money. The government's foray into student lending was already a mess, producing unintended consequences. So Johnson started a panel, headed by bureaucrat Alice Rivlin, to figure out what to do. There were two options, lend to colleges directly or keep lending to students. The panel decided that lending to students empowered them as consumers and encouraged colleges to compete, thus hypothetically holding tuition in check. Everybody wins, or something. But as banks started forcing interest rates up, Rivlin's panel proposed a new plan, creating a nonprofit, federally overseen agency that could loan to banks who could then loan to students. Following this plan in 1972, Congress created the Student Loan Marketing Association, AKA Sally May. They empowered Sally May to borrow money almost as cheaply as the federal government and provided guaranteed loans to banks who now assumed no risk. Sally May also bought back loans previously paid out by banks, the system was crazy convoluted. As Mitchell writes, Sally May was part of a circuitous route between lender and borrower. To recap, the Treasury Department gave money to the Federal Financing Bank, which lent to Sally May, which provided cash to banks, which lent to students who paid schools. If this sounds like gobbledygook, rest assured, not even the people making these laws totally understood what was going on. As Senator Jennings Randolph said in a 1981 hearing, if most members of Congress were asked what they thought of Sally May, they would respond with the question, who is she? The TLDR is that the more money students borrowed, the more money Sally May made. And it would become highly profitable, earning huge amounts through fees, interest, and commissions off of billions of dollars of loans. Because of their low borrowing cost, they made a return of 3.5% on student loans. Average returns over the past 50 years haven't exceeded 1.6%. Meanwhile, banks were free to lend money with nary a concern for the borrower's ability to repay because they were assured payment from the federal government. Presented with a wider market of students floating in a sea of loan money, colleges did what any industry would do. They raised prices. Tuition started rising every year, while for-profit universities sprang up to capitalize on the new college industrial complex. And it paid off. As Mitchell writes, Sally May's profits rose. Defaults too rose, driving up taxpayer costs. The banking industry profited, as did schools. Students and taxpayers incurred all the costs. He calls this the quintessential form of crony capitalism. It privatized profits and socialized losses. That is to say, when things went well, a few people made a bunch of money. When things went badly, the public lost a ton of money. Perhaps unsurprisingly, around the same time, the purpose of college began to conform more to Reagan's vision. 
students taking out increasingly substantial loans were less focused on obtaining a generalized liberal arts education and more focused on ensuring they picked a discipline that would get them a well-paying job so that they could pay off their loans. Numbers of business majors skyrocketed and humanities majors plummeted across the board. RIP to Aristotle and Shakespeare. This is reflected in what students said they value about their college education. In 1970, 70% of students called it very important or essential to develop a meaningful philosophy of life in their education. 40% prioritized using it to make more money. By the mid 80s, AKA the American Psycho era, these stats had flipped. While the whole rationale for lending to students instead of colleges was to create a more competitive market, the opposite kind of happened. As Mitchell explains, higher tuition made a school more attractive to families, not less. This was later dubbed the Shivas Regal effect for a high-end whiskey. College seems to be a good that people are more likely to buy if it's more expensive. As Roger L. Geiger explains, starting in the 80s and 90s, top institutions didn't compete by keeping prices reasonable. Instead, they competed by justifying high prices via their prestige maintained by marketing, recruitment, and branding. Along with that, a rising phenomenon of luxury perks on campuses would emerge, eventually ranging from glitzy condominium style living to gourmet food to recreational centers with rock climbing walls and lazy rivers. Author and journalist Ron Lieber calls this the beginning of an amenities arms race. See, the university can't stay out of arms races, any type of arms race, it just wants to be involved. But the absolute insanity of the student loan crisis and the number of people profiting off of it was about to go into overdrive. By 1990, Sally May had about $40 billion in assets, among them half of American student debt. But there was more money to be made. Sally May, along with its lobbyist, convinced Congress to let it become a for-profit publicly traded corporation. Remember that it could borrow at insanely low government level rates and you'll get why investments poured in from around the world. Sally May aggressively expanded, infiltrating every aspect of the student loan industry, stifling competition and offering private loans with interest rates as high as 28%. As of 2007, the top two executives had made more than half a billion dollars. Eventually, its main initial congressional backer, Bill Ford, would describe Sally May point blank as a money laundering operation. Guess they should have given Sally a more Italian sounding last name. It's okay, you're still, we're still allowed to make jokes about Italians, so if anyone got offended, you're wrong, I'm allowed to. I have an Italian grandpa, so it's okay. All the while, the cost of college was soaring higher and higher because it could. Sally May used its lobbying power to convince Congress to strip away consumer protections on student loans. Very importantly, this included the rules around student loan bankruptcy. Initially, back in 1976, Congress deemed student loans non-dischargeable in the case of bankruptcy, but only for five years. This number was extended to seven and eventually abolished altogether. To this day, student loans are the only kind of loan in American history to be non-dischargeable. I declare bankruptcy! Sally Mae and the banks weren't the only ones benefiting from rising student loans. As complaints about Sally Mae festered, Clinton signed a federal government direct loan program into law. This eliminated Sally Mae as the middleman. As the government began accumulating loans, it was able to use future repayments to balance its books. It essentially became what Bunch calls a form of deficit control. Meanwhile, just as college was being rendered unaffordable for all but a lucky few and creating a future of ballooning debt for the many, a college education was becoming more essential to job security than ever before. And the American government, the banks, and Sally Mae were all too eager to profit off that desperation. It stands to reason that as colleges became more expensive than ever before, the people in charge sought to run them in the most lucrative way possible like businesses. Everyone who teaches in our department has experience in the corporate environment as well. It's not just a textbook. Each one of us has had positions as president of corporations, senior VPs, vice presidents. We breathe reality. And that's a huge shift from how we used to view the university. Once seen as a source of public good, a place to train future teachers and clergy to help their communities, they've increasingly become corporations in their own right. As Henry Giroux writes, within the wider socio 
geopolitical environment, corporate power and interest are all too willing to define higher education as a business venture, consumers as investors, and the faculty as a cheap source of labor. Left to the logic of the market, education is something that consumers and investors now purchase for the best price, deal, and profit. He describes how this shift affects everyone involved. University presidents become CEOs, faculty become entrepreneurs, and students become mere consumers. From the top down, universities are governed by market-like principles based on metrics, control, and display of performance. And what's called an output of fundamentalism, the obsession with quantifiable data like productivity, performance, and the ability to bring in grant money, has supplanted any value of serious scholarly pursuit. And I got to see this firsthand. The last university I taught at full time evaluated our program on the basis of our students' ability to get full-time careers a year from graduating. Jobs like working at a bookshop or a coffee shop didn't count. So they evaluated our ability to teach philosophy and teach students how to think philosophically on their success on the open job market, and then we would get less money for the program on the basis of that. It was great. As scholar David Rosowski points out, running a college like a business, full stop, risks sacrificing some of the most foundational elements of a broad-based education, intellectual pursuit, inquiry, discourse, transmission, and discovery of knowledge, focusing only on those fields that generate revenue, maximize product, i.e. graduates value, and create wealth. Running schools like businesses inherently affects both what's being taught and how they're being taught. In this way, universities are being reduced to what sociologist Peter Siebold calls a corporate services station, where the values and topics being taught are functionally for sale to the highest bidder. Note that this is largely specific to science and business schools where corporate interests mostly lie rather than the humanities, because the humanities struggle to get private funding in the first place, and their departments often simply shrink or shut down altogether. I could not tell you how many philosophy departments have shut down since I started grad school. It sucks. For example, with STEM subjects, priority is given to topics that will bring in heavy investments from biotech companies, big pharma, and the military. Researchers are encouraged to pursue topics that will yield hefty funding rather than those of most scientific value. Remember how a huge amount of early government funding for universities was intended for military research? That's only intensified in recent decades. As Giroux argues, many universities have become irrevocably enmeshed in the military industrial complex. For instance, MIT gets 75% of funding for its robotics department from the Department of Defense. As Giroux writes, military research on campuses has dangerous implications for the academy and for the larger social order. It produces lethal weapons, subverts the peaceful use of scientific knowledge, fuels an arms race, debases the talents of the faculty and students. Take for instance the time in 2006 when scholars from the American Anthropological Association found out that some of their colleagues' work was adapted by the U.S. Armed Services to develop interrogation tactics at Abu Ghraib. For those of you who are fortunately young enough to have missed this exceedingly disturbing moment in the war on terror, that's the Iraq war era prison where the army and CIA committed especially heinous acts of torture, abuse, and murder. If you want Hollywood's inexact intro to this era, uh, check out Zero Dark Thirty. And if you want to get into the psychology of the people that did the torture, um, check out The Card Counter, starring Moon Knight. Back when President Dwight D. Eisenhower famously warned about the military-industrial complex, he considered also calling it the military-industrial-academic complex. Though he removed the latter phrase from his speech, he still noted that a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. But if you can't convince the Pentagon to throw you a few pennies, there's always hope that some eccentric billionaires might help. Florida State University made an agreement in which influential business magnates, the Koch brothers, pledged $1.5 million in exchange for being allowed to screen and sign off on any economic department faculty hires. Similarly, BB&T Corporation, a financial holdings company, gifted Marshall University's business school $1 million under the stipulation that Ayn Rand's objectivist novel Atlas Shrug be taught. In the business school, they had to teach Ayn Rand's book in the business school. Arguably, this has consequences. 
As Giroux writes, increasingly, universities are losing their power not only to produce critical and civically engaged students, but also to offer the type of education that enables them to refute the neoliberal utopian notion that paradise amounts to a world of veracity and avarice without restrictions, governed by a financial elite who exercise authority without accountability or challenge. Once places for collective growth and engagement with big ideas, universities are increasingly becoming places where people go to acquire skills for personal enrichment. Giroux argues that this produces robots, technocrats, and compliant workers. What's more, it refutes the idea of general education as a means of furthering democracy and public engagement. As scholar Stuart J. Murray explains, this logic co-ops and eviscerates the language of the common good. Essentially, if college were once about engaging people in their broader communities, increasingly, they're about benefiting the community of one. The laser focus on what the market supposedly wants and what makes for a profitable return on investment in education is only intensified by the for-profit university industry. For-profit universities have long existed on a small scale. They were among the first to implement correspondence education, the early version of online learning popular in the 1920s, where students were educated by mail. This is one of many tactics they used to appeal to non-traditional students, like high school dropouts. Still, they made up a very small segment of the college ecosystem for most of American history. In the early 1970s, just 0.2% of higher education students went to for-profit schools. But then came the University of Phoenix, Originally started by John Sperling, formerly a college professor and union activist, the University of Phoenix sought to make education more available to working adults. Within a decade, it had 6,000 students. It took its education online in 1989. Yes, 1989 and its parent company went public in 1994. It proved that for-profit schools, which had largely been small trade schools, could be highly, highly profitable. And many of those small schools similarly went public. For-profit colleges have a pretty good deal. They earn approximately 88% of their revenue from federal loans. That's because the government has a rule that they can't earn more than 90% of their revenue from those loans. This is supposedly how the government ensures that only super high quality for-profit schools will survive. 90%, that's how they ensure it's super, that's crazy, that's crazy government. You're crazy for this one, USA. But here's the catch. A large amount of the other 12%, according to sociologist Tressie McMillan Cottom, comes from veterans' benefits. Essentially, the government is providing nearly all the funding for for-profit colleges. Arguably, another huge turning point for for-profit schools came in 2002 with a simple Department of Education memo that indicated that for-profit colleges would not be punished for compensating recruiters based on how many students they enrolled. Enrollment subsequently soared, growing 75% from 2006 to 2010. But something more sinister was happening. There was spooky ghost at the colleges. No, that wasn't it. It's encapsulated by one example. Back in 2004, the University of Phoenix started a two-year associate's degree program. And all was fine and dandy until a 2008 investigation by the U.S. Senate's Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee found that 66% of students enrolled in the associates program had dropped out within the first year. Chair of the committee, Senator Tom Harkin, credits this to for-profit schools' recruitment methods. He explains, what drives the profits is how many students they enroll. The school gets the money. They pay their shareholders, they pay their school administrators, and the student drops out and has this debt hanging over his or her head for the rest of their life. My debt is always hanging here, but we just CGI it out because we have that technology. This is borne out by the way for-profit schools spend their money. Cottom argues that if budgets are moral documents, you can make your own judgments about how for-profit colleges make theirs. She reports that at some of these institutions, 22.4% of revenue is spent on marketing, while 17.7% is spent on instruction. And the marketing tactics have been pretty brutal. Back in 2011, Kaplan University documents obtained by the Senate told recruiters to keep digging until you uncover their pain, fears, and dreams and to get to their emotions and you will create the urgency. This is like advice for how to be a good Freddy Krueger as well. Similar documents from ITT Technical Institute suggested recruiters poke the pain a bit and remind them who else is depending on them and their commitment to a better future. This is even more sinister when you consider who for-profit schools are targeting. 
low-income and minority students. An alarming 30% of students who are single mothers attend for-profit schools. Promising a brighter future, these schools have capitalized on the gospel of education that pervades the American psyche. When I get a degree, I will make a bigger salary, so now I've got to see which college is right for me. As Bunch writes, in many cases, their aggressive pitch vastly oversold the value of their diplomas in the job market and elided the fact that courses were typically taught by harried, underpaid adjuncts. There have been attempts to rein in for-profit schools, like when the Obama administration added a gainful employment rule, wherein if not enough students earned enough to pay back their debt, the schools would be cut off from federal loans. But these institutions continue to flourish. Note that in 2021, the federal government canceled $6 billion in loans from these institutions after concluding in a class action lawsuit that they were to use the legal jargon, basically scam factories. The bottom line about for-profit schools is this. They're typically 30 to 40% more expensive than traditional universities and have a six-year graduation rate of 29%. That's less than half the rate of traditional universities. This all suggests that when education becomes a matter of profit over education, a lot of vulnerable people lose out. But there's more to the snowballing college fiasco. As nonprofit and for-profit schools increasingly ask for more money from their students, they're also increasingly giving less money to arguably their most important employees instructors, especially adjuncts, who have little in the way of job security or wages, but lots in the way of, of toilet paper that they steal from the university because they can't afford it at home. That's a real thing I've done before. Now, when I was an adjunct professor, which I was on and off for almost 10 years, I would teach at a rate between around $2,500 and $4,000 per a three hour course per semester. So let's say a semester is 15 weeks, that works out to $166 to $266 a if week. It was a three hour class that met three times a week. That is $55 to $88 per hour in the that class. That doesn't factor in time I spent also prepping. Also office hours for students. time spent grading, which could be up to 10 to 15 hours per class during finals. And then the there's time spent corresponding with which students. Which then means that those hours plus the three hours of teaching. And this doesn't factor in having to commute to multiple campuses throughout the and week. Of course, this all happened without getting any type of benefit. Which is why I didn't go to the doctor for five years once. That's a real now, thing. Now, if you're lucky enough to get four classes a semester, this looks like 20 to 32K a year, again, without benefits. And while I didn't work at any school that offered healthcare or anything, many universities like the University of California system have adjunct unions, which have recently insured benefits, which is really great but most don't do that. Now, many of the schools I taught at had students paying upwards of $50,000 a year in tuition. So think about all that money coming in and the small amount going out to the educators. And my experience is not unique. Increasingly, universities and colleges of all stripes, not just for profits, are relying on underpaid adjunct instructors. While back in 1969, 80% of faculty were tenure or tenure tracked, that number dropped to just 27% by 2016. This means a growing number of professors are living on poverty wages while working insecure jobs. It's hard to imagine producing rigorous scholarship or even being an effective teacher when you're worried about affording groceries. And this is all while administrators regularly make well into the six figures, with chief athletics administrators making on average $105,000 a year, or the amount that an adjunct professor would make if they taught around 35 courses in a year. Because why pay professors to teach when you can pay Duke's basketball coach, Coach K, 12.5 million to scream in your face? To be clear, I just told you that a college basketball coach made $12.5 million in one year at a university where in 2017, adjunct faculty were fighting for a living wage. After all, sports have become yet another vital way the universities turn education into a money-making enterprise. Sports earn universities billions of dollars, 19 billion from the NCAA alone in 2018. And this is all while the student athletes at the heart of the industry make nothing. And up until recently, didn't even have the right to use their name and image for endorsement deals of their own. As Jeru summarizes, too many universities are now beholden to big business, big sports, and big military contracts. If you were waiting for us to add, and to big students, 
don't hold your breath. That's no, that's not it. You know, that's not it. You've gotten to this point in the video. You know that that's not it. And this all makes it feel like the actual education part of the university is more of an afterthought or at worst, a necessary evil of the new business forward model of higher education. So where does that leave us today? Well, it's no surprise that millennials and Gen Zers who enrolled after them are still battling the vast majority of the country's $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. And according to the Department of Education, about $116 billion of that total is just from interest. And thus we have a self-fulfilling prophecy on our hands. If you don't get a degree in a field that's seen as profitable, you're destined to live on the brink of personal economic disaster. But you're more likely to join the 74% of Gen Z and 68% of millennials who put off major life decisions due to their student debt, like buying a house, having kids, or deciding between the pad tie or the pad CU. This economic anxiety has a direct influence on what people study. Since the 2008 financial crisis, for example, English departments across the country have lost about 20% of their majors as students favor STEM fields instead. History department enrollment is down 45% and I'm pretty sure philosophy departments have about like 18 months left at best. But journalist Adam Kirsch argues that we're missing out when we equate our degree to our career. He writes, much of what students of the humanities learn may not be directly applicable to their lives or careers. Very few of us need to know how to identify a school of painting or interpret a poem. But a humanistic education is supposed to teach us how to read critically and think independently, skills that are crucial to democratic citizenship. But the issue isn't that humanities degrees are suffering because they have poor job prospects, according to Benjamin Schmidt. Instead, students are fleeing humanities and related fields specifically because they think they have poor job prospects. While majors in business and science make a bit more than humanities majors, the difference is way more slight than what we are taught to believe. I.e., you can still go out to dinner with your buddy who went to business school, you'll just order a beer and a burger while she orders two martinis and the beef tartare. In other words, the idea that your major determines your income is more a matter of perception than a matter of reality. But this perception matters. Saddling students with loans increases the pressure they feel to get high paying jobs, potentially swaying them away from the kinds of egregiously underpaid professions they might have originally sought out, like education, social work, or being a public defender. At the same time, education is as valorized as ever in what Cottom calls the education gospel. She writes, the gospel is critical to higher education shift to its vocational premise. That is the idea that higher education is a moral good. She argues that because of this gospel, we increasingly demand more personal sacrifice from those who would pursue higher education. More loans, fewer grants. More choices, fewer practical options. More possibilities, more risk of failing to attain any of them. We justify that demand by pointing to the significant return in higher wages that those with higher education credentials enjoy. In other words, college is more expensive than ever, and it's harder to secure a solid career than ever, and yet we continue to elevate the importance of an egregiously expensive education to the point where students are incurring a lifetime's worth of debt, all under the belief that a degree is a necessary price of admission for a good life. So if the university has really devolved into a system in which basketball is valued more than intellectual curiosity, and in which the only people not financially screwed over are the administrators, and maybe its thousand year run is doomed. As Stuart Hall once said, the university is a critical institution or it is nothing. And as it seems to become less critical, it also seems to be becoming more, well, nothing. In America, politicians of all stripes have been proposing solutions. But short of some limited student loan forgiveness, which we totally welcome, but frankly find underwhelming, large scale change doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon. And the problem is so large scale and multifaceted that it's hard to even imagine what a quick fix would look like. It's infuriating and arguably specific. Across Europe, many college students are not burdened by the same price tags that their American counterparts face, in large part due to higher taxes overall, though even many European countries are sadly becoming more American in their approaches to higher education. But notwithstanding a broad shift in the way our society thinks about the collective burden of educating our citizens, the college problem, sadly, just doesn't feel very fixable. Which isn't the funnest place to land after watching a 45 minute video, but hey, imagine how we feel after researching, writing, and filming it. But what do you guys think? 
Is the American college system past the point of saving? Or is there a future where we rethink our societal attitudes about the purpose of education? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks as always to our patrons for all your support. And if you feel like paying five to $10 a month in tuition fees to wisecrack you, check out our Patreon page if you haven't yet. We'll have a link in the description. Like this video as if our tenure review depends on it, because honestly, it kinda does. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Later. It is weird that like, it's an online university. It's not really in a place. They could have chosen any city, yeah. you know what I mean? City, like, the, and that's, you sound prestigious with Phoenix. <laughs>